So good afternoon, and thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is Sally Charno, and I'm one of the organizers of today's talk. My co-president, Jeff Horn, and I are delighted to introduce uh, our speakers for you today. Uh, Jessica Johnson will be talking about her new work, Wicked Flesh, Black Women, Intimacy, and Freedom in the Atlantic World, which came out from the University of Pennsylvania Press in 2020. Uh, her interlocutor, her moderator today will be Laurel Semley uh, from the College of the Holy Cross. So for those of you who are joining us for the very first time, this is the fifth in our series uh, entitled French Press, New Books on French and Francophone History. And we will continue this series uh, meeting once a month from now through July, hiding, uh, highlighting new work of scholars in our expanding community. Uh, just so you mark your calendars, our next one is on June 20th, uh, in which uh, Laura Humbert will be talking about her new book, Reinventing French Aid, The Politics of Humanitarian Relief in French Occupied Germany between 1945 and 1952, uh, which is, uh, just came out from Cambridge in 2021. She will be interviewed by uh, Jess Pearson from McAllister College. So broadly speaking, the spring series lifts up writing that focuses on issues related to race, gender, colonialism, and occupation, and explores the relationship between the concepts of liberty and race and the practices of enslavement, disenfranchisement, and commemoration. So just a few notes on uh, housekeeping notes. Uh, you probably noticed that uh, you are muted and you can't turn your cameras on. All of this is for security reasons. Uh, and we have also disabled the chat. When the discussion opens up for the Q&A, we will open the chat and you'll be, you will be able to write your questions in the chat. Um, so again, thank you so much for joining us. And now I'm turning it over to my colleague, Jeff Holt. Thank you, Sally, and welcome everybody. Um, and just, we'll say this a couple more times, but when <clears throat> we get to that point where you're putting your questions in the chat, send them to me, because I'm gonna be kind of putting them all together for Laurel Semley. So I have the great honor of being able to introduce Laurel Semley, as I said. Uh, she is, as you heard, professor of history at the College of the Holy Cross. Uh, after spending time at Wesleyan, and uh, starting her career at Bryn Mawr College. She's the author of two books, uh, To Be Free and French, Citizenship in France's <coughs> excuse me, Atlantic Empire, which came out with Cambridge in 2017 and was the co-winner of the Bentley Book Prize from the World History Association in 2018. Her first book is entitled Mother is Gold, Father is Glass. Gender and Colonialism in a Yoruba Town, which came out with Indiana University Press <clears throat> in 2011. He is also the author of many articles, but the one that we wanna really highlight is Beyond the Dark Side of the Port of the Moon, Rethinking Bordeaux's Slave Trade Past, which came out with East Wales Social Social History <clears throat> in 2020 and was the winner of the French Colonial History Associ French Colonial Historical Society's article prize this year. So the final thing that we want to really uh, call attention to with Raoul Semley is that <clears throat> she is starting uh, a term as one of as part of an editorial team that has taken over uh, history in Africa, the journal of debates, methods and sources analysis, and she is uh, starting off her tenure with a special section on the digital humanities, which I know will be of great interest to this group. So enough about me, let's get on to the main event. Laurel? Thank you so much for that generous um, introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, it is uh, a pleasure to introduce Jessica Marie Johnson today at this event to discuss her wonderful new book, Wicked Flesh, Black Women, Intimacy, 
and freedom in the Atlantic world. The book has already received um, a couple of awards and has been a finalist in two others. The range of awards from the Louisiana Historical Association and the Rebel Women's Lit Caribbean Reader, as well as uh, fin being a finalist for an OAH and an African American Intellectual History Society Award, suggest the powerful range of this book. Dr. Johnson's academic, public facing writing and digital humanities work likewise reflects, reflect an incredible uh, and inspiring breadth and depth and creative power. In addition to previous articles uh, related to this project that have appeared in Slavery and Abolition, as well as in edited volumes, many of you probably know her from her work in digital humanities and her numerous interventions in critical Black digital humanities in the Black scholar, social text, and archipelago, uh, archipelagos. Uh, she also has an active set of projects um, as director of LifeX Code. And some of you also probably participate in um, the Slavery Archive Book Club as well, right? So without question, Dr. Johnson is a 21st century scholar activist, I would say, as in addition to being a public intellectual. Um, but you can read about that on websites or if you follow her on social media. I also wanted to uh, address the significance of her work and how it has transformed over time. Um, I actually met her eight years ago. <laughs> eight years ago, right? I was commenting on a paper that she wrote for AHA. It was a panel on senior. Um, and other than making me feel really old, <laughs> but uh, uh, it was really interesting to go back and look at it because it was an early iteration of the chapter in the book of Marie Baud or uh, Madame Pinet, which at the time she only had her name as Madame Pinet. So you could see it was an early intervention or an early uh, version, but all of the broad foundational points were there, right? The comparative transatlantic vision, the foregrounding of stories and perspectives of Black women and seeing slavery as a complex interplay of gendered material relations. Um, it was interesting to look at the work again because I could see the profound transformation, particularly in terms of uh, what I think are three really critical contributions from her book, and I wanted to highlight. Uh, one is the fact that her book is theoretically rich in its approach to history. Um, and the, the, theor the theorizing happens on many levels. And you'll, you'll, you'll hear that when she talks about her book. Um, her work, her archival work is, metic is meticulous and imaginative, not imagined, but imaginative in her creative approach. She looks at really difficult to find depositions, testimonies, accounts from slave ships. And she uses all of those items to build an incredibly lively narrative. Um, and then thirdly, she brings us this expansive challenge to the notion of freedom. On the one hand, freedom is elusive, and on the other, it's expansive and excessive and transgressive, especially when practiced by Black women. And, and I think that those seeming opposing impulses are a perfect way to capture the complexities of empire and the terror of slavery. At the same time, her book, for this audience, I wanted to talk about how the book reveals a rich French Atlantic history. Um, she starts off in the uh, French comptoir that were subject to well-off um, practices and ideas in the Senegambia region. She talks about French trading policies that commodified Black bodies, and she shows that as a process. Um, <clears throat> she suggests rich ideas about, uh, French ideas about slavery and freedom and how they're sort of uh, in, a, in a conversation with the ideas from Africans and, and people of African descent um, living in the Americas. Um, and showing again, how those ideas are incomplete um, and contingent, those ideas of freedom. What was interesting is that the slave traders and the administrators who are French never drive the narrative, right? They are marginal characters in a, as they should be in a story, in a history about black women. Um, so in this way, her multifaceted approach to history inspires us not only to think differently about historical analysis, but also about historical writing, especially in relation to the history of French empire. And I just wanted to give, just note a couple of quotes from her book, because the book is really beautifully written. Um, and you, when you read it, you are constantly rereading things and you're pondering them, you're scribbling down notes. 
And I just wanted to capture some of these ideas. One is on her idea about history as, quote, murky, contingent, and fluid, and the archive as one of disappearing bodies, limited detail, and excessive violence. On the notion of Black femme freedom, which she, she will probably talk about, she talks about it as gestating and as, quote, radically interpreting wickedness as freedom, intimacy as fugitive, and Blackness as diasporic and, and archipelagic. And then finally, to talk about the way that her book is rich in its theory, but also in its um, commitment to being accountable to the people about whom she's writing. She describes the interplay of history and memory as, quote, where history becomes memory, where practice becomes ritual, where Black women find life after death, Black women remember Black women. And I think all of these ideas, these encapsulate the challenging and exhilarating ideas. In the book. <clears throat> but I'm sure you're anxious to hear from her um, and to ask your questions. And so I'll just end by reiterating that it's a pleasure and an honor to share this virtual stage with her and to be part of this conversation. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Johnson to share more about her book. Thank you so, 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 so much. Um, I, <laughs> I can't believe it's been that long. <laughs> And I remember, you know, feeling then um, like I feel now that I am <laughs> honored <laughs> um, and, um, and, and in a bit of disbelief to, to have shared the stage then, uh, to have learned so much from you in your comments then and um, in, uh, in your work and to be, um, to be also inspired and to, and, to, um, and to learn from you. So, um, so thank you. So I'm, um, I'm, I'm really, um, I have a lot of emotions. <laughs> Um, and I'm really excited to to be here and be part of this conversation with you and with everyone here um, about um, about Wicked Flesh um, and to talk a little bit about what I wrote, um, what the research was about, and um, and how it came to be. So, um, Wicked Flesh, Black Women, Intimacy, and Freedom in the um, Atlantic World. When I when I talk about it in sort of a sentence, it's most of a sentence. It's a Black feminist history of the founding of New Orleans of the Gulf Coast. Um, which if anybody um, does uh, Gulf Coast history um, or Louisiana history um, knows that even bringing black women to the conversation is very much a, um, is a struggle. Um, bringing black communities, enslaved and free black people as foundational as they were to so the founding of that, um, of, of Gulf Coast society uh, is, really, is really hard and can be, um, and, and is really important work um, that I'm hoping that this book contributes to. But when I talk about it in a paragraph, um, I talk about the ways that um, this is a book, um, what I set out to do and, and hope, hope I did is write a book that was about African women, women of African descent, and the ways that they navigated a world that was forming around them and that they were also part of an actor in. Um, they're navigating a world of slavery as it forms around them, the world of slaves. So there's a few things there that I thought were really important that I really wanted to challenge um, in telling this particular story, um, a story that's centered on African women and women of African descent. One is that um, the idea that the 18th century um, is the beginning of the story. And, I, and this is a book that's situated squarely in the 18th century. It begins, um, if, if, when I um, talk about where it begins, it begins in 1685 with the French um, Claude Noir, and it ends in 1809, 1810 with the migration, um, the expulsion of um, Saint Domaine refugees from Cuba after, you know, Spain. Um, so it, it's a very, situated in an 18th century, at best a long 18th century. But um, I'm also grappling with uh, communities of, of African women in Senegambia who have long interactions with Dutch, with the Portuguese. That's a few, a couple of centuries earlier um, and a couple of centuries worth of interaction um, and history um, so that we get a category like the Sinha as a status that is derived from Senora, the Portuguese, that is derived from these European African interactions. And in um, and trade negotiations, which is also what, what they very much are. Um, and also wanted to get away from an idea of uh, the Atlantic that is in some ways very much grounded in, um, in ideas of race, of slavery, of freedom, um, even of capital that are still in formation. Um, so the, uh, the context in which the French and the British are entering, um, they themselves are elaborating on what it means to be the slave, what it means to be enslaved, 
and what it means to trade in this world. They're elaborating on ideas and codes of race. They're elaborating on what manumission is and what it will mean um, for themselves, for the populations they feel like they're over. Um, and they're doing that in contestation with Africans at the same time, with enslaved populations who are born in the Americas. Um, and so we don't talk about the 18th century enough as though um, the ideas of blackness or of race or also of womanhood or blackness and womanhood as a diet together, as though these things also have a history, um, as though these things change and, and develop and form and reform over the course of the 18th century. We tend to take it um, for granted that um, you know, blackness is a kind of degraded category, that slavery is, is death, et cetera, et cetera. And what I wanted to do was sort of return to some of those arguments and return to some of those ideas and really challenge, um, for me, I feel like I was challenging myself to go to the archive and not presume anything. If I don't presume that Blackness is X, then what is uh, what are people of African descent um, telling me about what it means to be African and what it means to be born of this place? It's one of the chapters on San Luis and Goye and, and the navigation of baptism and intimacy and intimate violence at the, at the, at the Comtoise. What does it mean to cross the Atlantic and then be defined by a code noir that defines Blackness in one way, but also to come with your own understanding of what it meant um, and what it still means, therefore, to you to be of various African uh, life ways, ethnicities, polities, however we want to define it. Um, what would it mean if I did not take for granted that there is a gender binary, that there are only two categories, women and men, from which to choose from in this world? Um, a thing that we should know by now is not true and is not even true in this time period. Um, so, what would it mean to not? presume that and instead to presume that the category of something like Black women are things that are getting formed in this time period and they're getting formed as they cross the Atlantic um, and that they may have multiple meanings. Um, that the French um, may define um, mulatresse as one thing and have an idea of like their wickedness, um, and particularly as part of that definition. They're, they, they are parasites, that they're you know prostitutes, lecherous, whatever, all these, these are actual words they use in the document. Um, that they might have an idea of what you know to be a black woman is, and you know what would it mean if I didn't presume that that was how um, Africans themselves understood themselves? Um, what can we learn from that? Um, and so the book, um, the book is operating with a lot of those as questions, as trying to figure out, you know, what does a history of black womanhood look like, and what does it look like in this context in which so much of it is about the French Atlantic. Um, and then some of it is also about, you know, what happens when empires change from Spanish, I mean, and, you know, like a touch, the, the last piece um, from Spanish to the, to the U.S. Um, so the, the book begins in Senegambia. Um, it begins with um, uh, women uh, thinking about um, uh, free African women and their navigation of the their interactions with Europeans, their navigation as intermediaries with uh, the Wolof, their, their, um, their um, residence at the Comtoise and what kinds of uh, you know, negotiations they're having. Are they laborers? Are they market women? Are they securing property? Um, it discusses um, things that, that come out of those interactions like Maria Jalamo Dupe, which is um, a form of partnership, um, conjugal partnership that emerged in this particular region that has residences up and down the coast, um, but it's called Marie Jean Maud Dubé um, in particular here and is a combination of Catholic and, and Wolof forms of, 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 of ritualized, um, ritualizing partnership. Um, so it, it, it begins with thinking about um, the women in this region as um, as having something to do with the commerce that develops between French and um, and Wolof in this case, um, and Labou in this case, um, and the slave trade that develops. Um, it situates them as tastemakers, as um, uh, fig key figures in these exchanges, in these commercial exchanges, in these diplomatic exchanges. So I really try and position the conversation here as a matter of geopolitics, not a matter of French coming in and colonizing, not a matter of, of, of Wolof um, you know, taking advantage and and selling Africans to you know out out into the out west. Um, this is a matter of of dip diplomacy um, in a lot of ways. Um, and what is that? You know, where are African women situated in that? They're situated in a lot of places, but in one place they are is that they're taste making. They're helping to cultivate the exchange of goods that includes a cultivating a kind of um, taste a, 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 a taste that is status at at the at the comptoise. 
that is everything from what they're wearing to the kind of household goods you have in your home to the kind of home that's built. Um, and so it moves from there to then thinking about, you know, as time proceeds, a community that is not just taste making, but actually lives in this place, this place, and, and use those terms specifically, this place that has to now get defined as something um, at San Luis, at Gore, in this, this corner kind of coastal band um, that runs along um, the Atlantic coast. Uh, and so there is, um, this is a debate, like all things um, about uh, essentially, you know, who you belong, what society you belong to, your subjecthood, your citizenship, um, who are your dependents. Um, what this place will be is very much a debate. And the key figures in here, I argue, are free African women in particular, who own slaves, who own enslaved women, who own property, who are the dealers of, of labor and of, of commercial and ritual practices um, at the Comtois and um, have to be, the French have to deal with them. Um, but that dealing also creates um, an argument and a debate over what this place will be and what it means. So I try to kind of look at some of that and some of those um, those conversations that women are having. Um, and then it begins to move um, across the Atlantic. So um, there is um, what I sort of call in my head a bridge chapter, um, um, which is a chapter that looks at the slave trade from the perspective of um, women and girls. And I use that really loosely because one of the things that the book really tries to do again is not presume a gender binary, um, but also take very seriously that the slave trade, as Horton Spiller's um, magnificent um, um, article, Mama's Baby, but so much of her oof, um, is looking at you know these, these complicated gender relations and complicated ways of thinking about race and gender together, blackness and womanhood together. Um, the slave trade is a fundamentally um, ungendering um, process, like that its purpose is a kind of commodification and a reduction of African to beyond bodies, beyond, beyond genders, beyond bodies, to something that she describes as flesh. Um, and this is also, you know, and I'd love for this to be a discussion, how I interpret Spillers. I have read Spillers, I, and I say this to my students all the time, I read her over and over again, I've read her over and over again for almost two decades, and still I learn something different and see something different when I come back to her again. So in the moment that I was encountering Spillers, which I hope Will always continue to be evolving and changing. Um, so there's um, articulation of flesh is something that's even even beyond and, and reduced from the body. Um, and what do, what do, what do we do if that flesh is something that is also sexualized? Is and that the commodification, sexuality, sexualizing them, um, sexualizing Africa, captive African is actually part of their commodification. The price <laughs> that they are. Um, sold for, that they're traded for, is actually also tinged on how, how beautiful, quote unquote, beautiful they, they are, how um, attractive they are, how or whether or not they can, um, they can be raped on the ship, um, whether or not they can be marked for production on land. Um, and so it grapples with, with a lot of that and with thinking about what is this long middle passage that proceeds from capture somewhere in the continent um, to the Comtois, into the, um, the, the belly of the ship, and then into the Americas. Um, and the second half of the book um, looks at then, you know, what is this thing called blackness and womanhood that has now, um, uh, you know, grappled with La Traverse, um, and now must grapple with slave holding societies in the Americas, which are not now majority black, when in fact, blackness is a kind of um, uh, 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 graded signifier. Um, what then do you make of blackness? And it turns out you can make many things as well as have to negotiate many things, as well as be subject to many things. So um, the full use of her chapter is a chapter that looks at the women who arrive as they're arriving um, and what is, it, what is kind of black womanhood in this space. Um, well, it's a, it's a defining of who can be used. Um, so fem, feminist, femininity, to be feminized and is not a thing even that's limited to black women, African women, women of African descent. It's a thing that is about um, what ways can the empire commodify you um, and how far can it do so? Um, so there's a lot of discussion there about use, about men who also are you know, participating in empire, who themselves you know, appear to us in the archive because they're participating in empire, but also um, get their freedom that way. You know? And so what are the ways that now freedom is also tinged with this kind of modification and this use aspect as well? Um, and where do women situate themselves in that? Um, and um, the chapter after that looks at, in some ways, you know, uh, the other side of that. You know, what are the ways that uh, African women now having arrived have to turn 
upside down what it means to be um, black um, have, and turn it into um, something that I'm, that I'm always um, fascinated by um, across time periods, um, even into the 20th century, the ways that um, black people, people of African descent, turn what is supposed to be their, 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 um, their degradation into something that is um, diasporic, something that is a unifier, something that is, you know, can be a powerful claim of identity and of kinship. Um, and so this chapter is about about how that operates and how those claims of kinship are also um, translate into, um, in some cases, claims of impotence for manumission um, that are operating within kinship groups. Um, and in different cases are claims for space, claims for gathering, uh, feasts, play, uh, aesthetic behaviors, you know, so many different ways that what is supposed to be wicked um, actually um, is turned upside down by, um, by Africans themselves. And um, the practice of that is, is, is what I describe as, as Black from the way of capturing this moment of a kind of radically different version of Blackness um, that does have a moment. Because the chapter after that is called Legacies of Freedom. It's about the transition to the Spanish period. Um, and it looks at the ways that Spanish come in with a different version of what their kind of codes of race are. Um, and that complicates, and codes of property and manumission, and that complicates um, some of these solidarities. So that now the property principle, um, the principle of securing manumission, but also of owning things, of passing things on across legacies, that becomes a point of strong contestation within and among um, people of African descent, enslaved and free. Um, and so the, those complications, those tensions, um, and the emergence of a, of a free community of color that is very much about their Manumission Act and property is the subject of that, of that chapter um, and the foundation that gets laid, um, I argue, in the conclusion for the 19th century and how we think about freedom as well as um, la femme de Gouloury, um in the 19th century in Indiana. So, um, so that's the book. Um, I'm looking forward to, to discussing it more and, and talking more and going deeper into some of those um, those details, whatever people feel interested in chatting about. I'm also happy to talk about digital humanities projects as well. So. Great, thank you so much for that for that overview of the book um, and taking us through the the sort of landscape of it. Um, I wanted to start by asking uh, the privilege of being the uh, the moderator uh, and by asking a question or two, and then um, as questions come in. Um, I can pepper it in with some of my my own questions, but um, I will let others um, uh, ask questions as well. So I'm, I'm just trying to think of if I want to ask this question or the other. I'll start with this question um, because I, I think um, I've always thought this in terms of the book writ large. So it's clear that um, I think that your heart belongs to New Orleans, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> and, um, and but this book um, is much more expansive, right? And I wanted to know if you could talk a little bit about how you, you came to see the need to start on the African continent, right? Um, in order to, you clearly believe that you had to show these interconnected worlds of women who inhabited and traversed uh, the, the Atlantic. Um, but when did you, Come to envision your work in this intentionally expansive way? Was it always part of the plan? Did it emerge from the document, right? You talk about sort of having an open mind, or was it a gut feeling that you had to write a big history in terms of like geographical? Sure, and thank you. Thank you for this question because it gives me a chance to really, you know, talk a little bit about, I guess, my um, in into my African diaspora genealogy, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, so, um, so there's two threads there that that um, that are really important in in just how I approach the field, right? And thinking about black life, a black Atlantic, which is what it was when I when I was first going to grad school. Now we talk about it in a different way. And before that was compared to black history. So, um, so. On the one hand, um, I was very influenced. Um, in thinking about how to approach and how to think about Black life in this world that circles the Atlantic by Michael Gomez and his work, um, and also uh, Gwendolyn Midlow Hall and her work. Um, so uh, the framing of, of Gomez exchanging country marks um, and the, the um, reversing sale um, and the, the, the 
uh, stance and the um, the um, it's, it's a methodology of beginning African diasporic scholarship with what is happening with how Africans are creating their own worlds in the continent itself, and then how that is what happens um, on in slave trades on the ship, as well as um, as well as in Africa. Um, the um, forming the the forming the, the understanding of the trade between Senegal, Gambia, um, between West Africa and Louisiana as a long middle passage that is very much informed by um, Gomez's framing of uh, the slave trade as beginning at point of capture. Um, and so that um, that work is is really critically important. Has really shaped how I think about you know how we can think about Black people in the Americas broadly. Um, and I mean like all of North America, South America, Latin America, Caribbean context, all of that. Um, so that was very, very important. The other side that was really, really important, of course, are um, our two scholars that have really you know, put their stamp on, on my work and how I see my work. One, of course, is my advisor, Ira Berlin, whose formation of Atlantic Creoles very much informs um, and informed how I began to even think about the, um, the coastal societies and their interactions between um, um, European entities and, and African polities that are deeper in the countryside. Um, and so thinking about the Atlantic Creole as a framework, as a way of thinking about um, thinking beyond sort of a binary, that binary of European and African in this world and thinking they're actually complex societies, complex individuals who are making all kinds of choices, whether it's um, working on, on, on slave ships or trade ships, whether it's trade with Europeans, um, whether it's um, you know, being part of, of, of communities uh, like at San Luis or remaining within Wolof policies. Like th there's a lot to learn. So Lenta Creole becomes a jumping off point, a point to, to look beyond that European African binary. Um, but also part of this conversation is the amazing work of Hillary Jones, um, who has a phenomenal book on um, Senegal that looks at the seigneurs and seigneurship as it emerges into the 19th century and becomes the Matisse, the Matisse the Abitan of, of particularly of San Luis and becomes so, so critical in 19th century um, Senegalese um, history and as well as scholarship. Um, and so, Part of the revision of the Atlantic Creole that I thought was really important is, is also very much um, in conversation with her and her formation that, yes, there is a kind of category here that is you know, in between and, and on, this, um, on this Atlantic littoral, but it's also African. And if we don't treat <laughs> what's Africans on the continent as though, you know, like, as though they are also complex beings who can you know, have complicated relationships with Catholicism, thinking of Congo and Gola, or complicated, or, or Senegambia, or complicated relationships as far as the aesthetic choices that, of what they're wearing, that, uh, who of course are multilingual in so, so many ways, not just of European language, but of many, many languages and, and, and dialects across um, uh, African communities. If we're not taking that seriously, then we're actually doing something wrong. And I know that other scholars are, of course, part of that conversation, um, GB comes to mind immediately. Um, your work also very much thinking about trans African is like, you know, like there are, we limit ourselves when we just say there's only two ways of thinking about it. And if you turn the coin over on one side or the other now, now they're not no longer African, they're European or vice versa. Um, and so all of that, you know, shapes, you know, how I was thinking about um, how I want to understand Black life in America in general. The specifics of looking at Senegambia emerge in thinking about, thinking with Wen Hall's work, of course, um, and also thinking about like, you know, what it means to study a place like the Gulf Coast and really take seriously that there is a concentrated slave trade that comes in a concentrated period of time. And that hasn't, that does have an impact on who arrives, um, the kinds of choices that, that Africans make uh, uh, upon arrival, the kinds of cultural and political and social formations that emerge, um, and the way that the French themselves are relating to them. And so there's, um, I won't get into the many, many long debates about the slave trade and African ethnicities and whatever else, but I've always been struck by the ways that the Gulf Coast really sort of defies the binaries in those debates in the question of whether, oh, it's, it's how many ships come or it's how many ships come from a place or, you know, oh, we can't, can't um, show how many African ethnic ships. Oh, we can. Like the Gulf Coast shows that actually that whole those those terms of the question are um, not <laughs> not complex enough for what happens within a given society when you have something as devastating as like I say happening to people, but you also have people who 
build something about themselves and also come with tools and resources of how to understand um, this world. So I was really struck and I'm always really struck by the ways that um, Senegambian life and society, uh, see those life ways pop up in some really um, rich ways that we often recognize them in the archive because they're cultural, <laughs> they're either language formations or their names. Um, uh, they're, um, they are um, musical formations, um, a whole host of things. Um, but I wanted to kind of think about, th in this book, think about what would it mean if, if we talked about the cultural forms, but also talked about um, ways of thinking about um, gender, of, of, of leadership, of trade, of interaction with Europeans in general, interaction with strangers. What if we thought about those as also part of the conversation as well? Um, so that's why um, that's why Senegambia um, really loomed important. But and the last thing I'll say is like the thing that I really hope comes out of engagement with text is that people know that Senegambia like this is just one of New Orleans Atlantic worlds, um, plural. Like the Senegambia Louisiana relationship, I think is very distinctive and critical. There's also one that comes out of Benin and Wida. There's also one that's a Congo and Golden one, especially in the Spanish period when the slave trade reopened. And the Spanish are, are, are allowing ships to come, and many of them are coming from Congo and Angola um, because that is such a heavy player in the slave trade broadly. And so I would, I mean, I would love to see many, many studies of La Clarese, many, many studies of Black society that move into all these other kinds of diasporas, other interactions as well, because there's so much more um, to be done. The Benin trade is actually the trade that we had when it comes to um, Benin to Louisiana. That's actually a trade where we have more information about the gender breakdown. Like, what does that mean? Like, what can we learn from that in thinking about, you know, Benin trades broadly, but also specific to Louisiana? So I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> That's great. I actually had another question, but there's a couple of questions here that uh, are, are grouped together that I'll, I'll share with you that I think feed off of the, 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 the comments you just made. And there are two questions about archives. So one is from Alyssa Seppenwall, who thanks you for a wonderful book and an introduction. And um, she wants to know if you can talk about your relationship to archives. You found things that people might have thought were absent, <coughs> abs absent, but you still have to be creative. How do you think about using them in the wake of writing your book? And then also there's a question from um, Julia Prest, who says, thank you for outlining this fascinating book. I would love to know about the sources that you used and how going to the archive with no preconceptions affected what you found. These are, thank you, um, thank you. Um, these are um, big questions. Um, I did research on um, three different continents. So I did research in Senegal, I did research um, in France at um, the overseas archives, which the Mer and Aix en Provence, and I did research, of course, in Louisiana, which has amazing archives. Um, and most of their original material actually is in France, so that was an interesting, um, that was an interesting uh, thing to learn pretty early on. Um, and I was struck by how much there was to find um, if we sort of if we just sort of looked for it. Um, so, for example, in the in the Aix en Provence um, uh, materials, um, I was surprised. I thought I would have to do a lot of sort of hunting and sort of trying to like you know find particular women and um, think about um, you know what are women doing in this period? Like, what is the conversation? Like, I, I imagine a world in which the French are essentially sort of ignoring African women and going about their business, and maybe there's like a line in a in a register, which there are those as well. Um, but I was surprised by how much um, uh, like letters to the governors, um, letters between the, the company directors on the ground and the directors and the investors in France, um, how much they were really preoccupied with um, African women and their interactions. Um, they were concerned about, you know, um, fans and questions about inheritances and um, and they were they were nosy. Like they were they would talk about um, you know, oh, you know, these two women, they were fighting, but they were upset because, you know, one of them was, you know, um, you know sleeping with somebody else. Like they, they, they were titillated, essentially, um, by what they heard and saw and experienced um, at Saint Louis and Goré. Um, and that, you know, that, you know, uh, the, the titillation is, is a self-interest. 
And I think there's a lot more work to be done in that in that C6 series um, for that, that French bracket and even more to be done for anybody who's watching his dissertator in that Portuguese and Dutch bracket that's right before the 1680s. Um, the 17th century material, there's so much there. You know, Phil Havoc has work on it. Um, I think Mark Hinch's work is a little bit later. Um, but yeah, so um, so I was surprised that I was surprised that there was that kind of information, and um, it, it, it's always a um, work to sort of read, you know, past that sort of fascination and past that kind of their, their own kind of lecherousness, because that's that's a reality of this world is that um, this is a world of world of slavery and colonialism is a world in which um, African women, Black women are Europeans are learning to um, to have a taste for the sordid of Black people. And that includes a taste for the sordid of the intimate lives of, of Black women and it, um, impositions on Black women. Um, so there's that work of reading into that. Um, but there's also, you know, um, a material there that is about, it's essentially about the so social lives of, of Africans at the Comtois and the ways that those social lives interface with commerce. Um, and in that sense, it kind of made sense. Like, oh, of course, the governors are concerned about who is having, um, you know, fights with each other uh, because that disrupts the labor flow of the of the sons and and daughters also of the African habitants who are employed by the company. Because there's not that many European men were around. There are a lot of African employees of the company. Gourmets, daptats are. There's kind of words sometimes can be used interchangeably, but um, employees of the the habitants. Um, so you have material material like that that becomes really, really interesting. Um, and then you have material uh, in the same way in a kind of in the Senegambian context, like things like the Etat Civil, which gives a really, really strong sense and a really rich sense of who is giving birth to who. So this is a, this is the register of, of marriages, births, and deaths. Who is giving birth to who? Who is dying? Um, most of the Etat Civil is actually, again, same thing. Euro European men are, are trying to avoid this place because they are dying in droves, the place in which they die of drownings, of warfare and also of, of, of illness really rapidly. Um, and those, those um, it's a civil are full of the, their names over and over and over. Um, they're also full of, 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 of births. And those births also are Catholic, so they also come with God parentage um, in a lot of cases. So that gives us a kind of a net of kinship and um, that can also be, be really, really rich and interesting. And you see that kind of parallel of letters between governing officials in Louisiana as well. Um, See that's a parallel of, of the sacramental records and of, 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 of birth and death registers, also in Louisiana. Um, and so there's a lot of really great, um, really, really great material that I think um, can be really, really useful. Um, I think the trick that is, um, along with sort of going and, and not presuming that you won't find anything, I think the trick is also a kind of interesting navigation of, of, of uh, at least in the French context, sort of uh, French presumptions that there's not there's nothing there to be found. So there aren't finding aids of black women, African women in a place and what they're doing. Finding aids are, you know, like very generalized and, you know, here are all the different interactions, here are what the letters say. But if you actually go in and read the letters, if you actually you know, roll the microfilm, if you actually turn the pages of the folio, you actually find a lot of material. And so I would look forward to um, you know, like BNF and um, the archives and, and other repositories really taking seriously that colonial history and those, um, the lives of Africans of Black descent in France's broader empire and building finding aids that really do that, that work and really get into that. That's great. Um, a question about the archives. And so I'll actually, I have a question I think follows up on this and then I'll get to other questions that are in the feed. Um, so, um, one of the things I noticed uh, is that you have a very powerful way of talking about French officials and policies and their impact on practices and lived realities on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, but I mentioned how you, you don't let them become the star of the narrative, right? Um, it, but you evoke Frenchness in a variety of ways. Um, you talk about the ephemeral politics of taste. I love the way you use Simon Kigandi's work there. Um, but I, I do think that when you talk about French and Frenchness, you, you're not just talking about an individual slave captain or colonial officer, um, especially because you are talking about that interface, right? The way in which there's an interface between the French and the and African women and Africans in general. Um, 
So given how France and the French are definitely present, but not overpowering in the book, how do you envision this work fitting into the expanding scholarship on French empire, Black France, the study of slavery and race in France and its empire? No, I, um, I would love to see this book in text, um, in syllabi on each of those topics, <laughs> because I think there's ways that, yes, it, it, it does not. And I did that, and I'm so glad it, it, it reads that way, because I did that deliberately, and that was really hard. <laughs> Try and write in a way that um, moved, you know, French officials essentially to the, the side players <laughs> of the story that is really, um, that has, has so many um, Black women African women, women of African descent, who are who are really central characters, essential historical subjects. Um, but it, that doesn't mean that it's not um, a, a Black French book. In fact, it has so much to say. I hope. Um, I, I hope that it has so much to say about um, old the old regime France, about um, police codes as they operated out of the French metropole to the places that you know French. First, like trading companies, and then like the crown itself, trying to you know ex exercise its dominion on. But if we look at the history of of black women in this 18th century moment, we don't just learn about black womanhood and the ways that it, it also is shaped and changed and um, emerges and is contested and is is demanded over the course of this 18th century. We also learn through those contestations all the different ways that. Um, that France and all of their officials on the ground and, and in the metropole really made it, uh, were concerned with intimacy, sex, gender, were concerned with the rabble broadly, um, understood trolling um, um, African women's sexuality in particular as very much a broader issue of control of, of, of white, uh, uh, unsettled whites essentially. Um, uh, Engage, Forsat, soldiers, um, slaves, uh, privateers. Um, there was a broader concern about how do we um, impose our dominion in foreign places that are far away? How do we compete with the Spanish and the Portuguese and their, their legacy? How do we compete with the British who are right next to us, usually, <laughs> on these ships, like <laughs> a horizon away, trying to, you know, to also, you know, acquire land, property, who are literally battling with us. St. Kitts is literally a showdown between the French and the British. Um, how, do we, how do we have control? And that battle over and that, and that discussion and debate over how to control and how to create an empire, um, it's very much also the, the debate and the contestation that the African women are fighting against. They're fighting against this, this presumption um, that you can have an empire. They're fighting against French um, imperialism and, and the, and, and the um, the way that the French Empire is trying to learn and learning over and over, okay, this is how you control a population. Okay, this is how you control land. This is how you engage in diplomacy with indigenous populations, because that's also a really key piece that is very particular, the French Empire in the Americas um, that is not Caribbean based. It's the engagement with um, indigenous polities in the North American context. Um, and so they're constantly trying to um, trying to figure out what that means and what that looks like. And the way they talk about it is sort of um, as though it's a foregone conclusion. It's like, oh no, of course the French did blah 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 blah. And then you know, 50 years later, well, of course, you know, the French like Mesalians, that's a bad idea. We should never we like you know, like we would never do that. That never happened. Like there's a kind of like erasure and revision of their own history that is happening at the same time. Um, but from that, we can actually learn that oh, okay, so this is how empire learns how to reproduce itself. Um, and I think. That what is happening in this book, we, we can see that on the ground as well. And we see so much of that in, in the interactions with, with law, um, interactions with women themselves, interactions with commerce, with how they're understanding what the trade is, their engagement with trading companies, the rise and fall of those, as well as their engagement with, um, with various populations, including um, um, white and So I think that that can be really, really critical. Not, not and it should, it, it should go without saying, but I, I I'll say it is that it's also important to think about, you know, like there are <laughs> there's a blackness of of France, the blackness of French Empire, and that this is very much part of it. So we learn something also about the black populations that are in France proper that are and uh, that are arriving, some of them from these slave trades, from Saint Domingue, from 
um, there's definitely um, Africans who are going as servants and as porters of, of employees of France coming from Louisiana. So we learn something about, oh, and of course there's the, I actually talk about them, the women who are circulating between France and Senegal as well. So, there, so we learn something about the history of blackness in France proper um, by learning something about how these, these interactions are happening um, in the broader, broader empire. Hopefully it's exciting to, I hope it's on all of these syllabi. I hope I, have, I hope I have something to offer all of these, yes. all of these syllabi, you know? Definitely, definitely. And, and, and I, I, I appreciate that last point about those sort of ongoing connections um, across the Atlantic. Um, I, I think this is an important part of your, your book. And so I want to make sure we fit this, this particular question in. It's from Tip Reagan. Uh, thanks you for your wonderful talk. And um, it says, you mentioned how you don't see things um, even in the 18th century as functioning under a sexual, bi under a sexual binary. I was wondering if you would say a little bit more about this issue and perhaps give an example of how sexual difference um, as is resisting a binary um, as informed in your. Um, thank you. Um, thank you for that. Um, so one of the things that I have been very interested in over um, in my research broadly um, is how we can think about um, histories of slavery that are also queer and trans history. Um, and for me, that has meant um, really trying to think differently about how the documents offer, what the documents offer as far as thinking about like what you might call quote unquote women's history or call gender history. Um, historians of slavery in the Atlantic side at least have been very um, lazy <laughs> about how they read documents. And so um, the extent to which it says um, men or women in the document is sort of presumed, the extent to which, um, and I talk about this even in um, the full use chapter, um, discussing Louis Congo becomes um, the um, uh, black executioner in Louisiana uh, and secures his freedom for that. Um, and um, the historiography has sort of tended to say, oh, he also got freedom for his wife. Um, he doesn't get freedom for his wife. He actually read the document, he gets to rent her from the trading company, um, except when the trading company has need or use. Um, and so there's a kind of like, um, there's, a, there's a latent heteropatriarchy to the historical study of documents of slavery. And there's a latent sort of uh, nuclear familyism that makes sense. I, I said this would be the anti Moynihan agenda <laughs> on Twitter when I was talking about this talk, um, given some recent conversation on Twitter about these things. Um, but there's a kind of like a, a kind of um, a grappling with, you know, what is the family? Um, what is kind of like a, a domestic space um, um, for historians of slavery who are looking back. And so what I wanted to do was not make those presumptions. Um, and that turned out to be, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I was always successful across the entire book, um, but I especially really tried to focus on doing it with the slave trade chapter because of the ways that we do have to think about what that commodification does to gender, to what it means to have and be a gender. Um, what does it mean and, and what are the ways that gender operates if a woman is only three-fourths of a unit and, and that's presumably maybe three-fourths of a person, a piasta and, um, because that's all that an enslaved person could be on the ship as their quantity, as their commodity, as the way that they figured into their use within the sl emerging slaveholding economy. Um, so already, and again, I'm drew, drawing so much of this and in conversation with spillers, already we're grappling with the insufficiency of gender as a concept to really capture how um, captive sociality is operating and what's even possible in the belly of a ship, um, much less when you actually land um, and you are, you are are off the ship and engaging in. Um, and so, uh, so, so, I think one of the things, uh, one of the key things there for me was really. Um, Presuming, thinking about gender as though, um, what would it mean if genders that are that you walk onto the ship with, that are situated um, in some context of of home, of community, of rituals, of 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 age, uh, rituals of puberty, rituals of of uh, of of uh, partnership? Um, what if those are no longer available to you? Then what? gets, uh, or available in the same way, what gets created and recreated um, 
or what gets what emerges um, on the other side of the Atlantic in contestation, and which is also a conversation um, with things like the Code Noir and rules that. Um, so I just so that, so that was a really really key piece. Um, but I think also you know one of the things that I'd hope to find, which I did not find necessarily in this archive yet, although I think that I am. Um, I, I'm hopeful that there is still something there, and I know that this is something available that isn't available in other archives, um, were partnerships that were explicitly um, of those who understood themselves to be of the same gender. Um, the closest I, um, I, I am able to um, draw on that kind of um, intimacy and that kind of kinship and that kind of um, love for each other um, are the stories of of the women um, in that chapter five when they're talking about put black from free? Um, so thinking about what does it mean to um, to engage in in gatherings together um, in like in actual defiance of of laws that that you could you could would be physically maimed or executed? What does it mean to actually do that anyway? What does it mean to um, to defend each other um, against um, essentially a sexual assault um, and you are killed anyway? Um, that that kind of radical um, loving of each other is extremely queer in a world where hetero masculinity is the name of the game and when it's where its power is so absolute and violent that you can use your life for for um for essentially you know holding hands together and not wanting to be you know, um, assaulted by a soldier, which is one of the examples that, that's in that chapter. Um, and so those are those are the kinds of examples I um, I am reading as not just um, you know it's also like fancifully gendered, um, but also as part of like a Black femme practice um, that is about Black femme as uh, and the Black lesbian queer formation as uh, as a radical practice as a practice practice as a politic that's an action that's a defense of each other um, of of women um, for women loving loving other women. Um, I do have um, colleagues though. Um, um, group that I run with um, Vanessa Holden, the Queer Slavery Working Group, who are working on same-sex um, relationships, um, actual partnerships, marriages, et cetera. Um, but I think that there's something important about what does it mean to go into an archive and not necessarily have those as like marriage examples, but you know, abolish marriage. Um, and what do, how then do we read queerness and how do we read transness? Like what are the ways that we can um, understand that in ways that themselves also are not structured by some of the property relations that we that was a very long answer, but hopefully I wanted to get at all the kind of contours of that question. All right, so this will be, I'm going to try and create one last question that combines uh, the essence of a couple of things that are here and a question I had. So um, I think um, you in some ways answered Christy uh, Piquero's question about, um, uh, looming mysteries and sort of questions that might uh, still be in the archive uh, there. I think you've, you've talked about that a little bit with your last response, um, but there were two questions and I had a question. So the last question, a question from Kesua John um, about sort of the refusal of race in, uh, in France, if that is something that prevents French archives from creating finding aids that center black women or black people. Um, and I think that relates a little bit to um, one of the early, uh, uh, this question about um, uh, just, just African women over time in terms of them being tastemakers, um, the evolution of food ways. I mean, if you're thinking about um, finding black women in a range of ways, right? Sort of in the, in the archives, like what, what might be some other ways? Um, and the last thing that I wanted to sort of make a bridge to is the fact that you do have all of this incredible digital humanities work, critical black digital humanities work, and which I think um, allows for these sort of connections, these broader connections and broader challenges to the archive and what we have in the archive. And so I'm wondering if, um, if you can find a way to actually use that way of that sort of critical Black humanities work uh, as a way to sort of maybe address these questions, these broader questions about looking for things differently, looking at archives differently, um, and uh, sort of the continuing work that you're doing. Yeah, these are great questions. Thank you, everybody. Um, 
So, um, so to the question about um, the refusal of race in France as part of the problem, yes. <laughs> The answer is yes. <laughs> um, the, the problem with that is that it's, it's a structural refusal. So it's a kind of um, embedded um, uh, refusal to not only grapple with, 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 rape, with blackness, with blackness in all of its dimensions um, and race more broadly, um, but it's also a kind of like refusal to acknowledge, you know, the, the long, long, long colonial relationship between France and various, um, various places around the world, not just in the Atlantic circuit, but of course, globally. Um, and, um, and a refusal to kind of, um, you know, do a substantial work to, to document it, to, um, yeah. I'll put it like this. One of, the, um, one of the really interesting things that I learned in, in trying to do this work in Louisiana um, was that, uh, you know, it, it was until recently, I believe that um, the sacramental records um, were, were it's really hard to get into the Sacramento records and the RCC Diocese of, of New Orleans. Um, and um, I was doing a, a presentation on um, John Blasting Game, a tribute to John Blasting Game, um, not too long ago. I believe it was sponsored by OAH. It was in New Orleans at Ashe Cultural Center, a beautiful, beautiful event. Um, and a conversation started between more recent archivists at the, at the Archdiocese and the work that they've been trying to do to open up the archives. Um, and, um, and this was in New Orleans, so the many, you know, black genealogists, black family members, and black historians who were there who had been trying to research in, in archives like that. Um, and one of the things that was said was that, you know, part of the problem is, part of the fear is that if people actually went into that archive and really had clear guides and really started excavating some of these histories, then there would be a kind of reparations that was due. The, the descendants of those who were enslaved, descendants of those who were um, who were part of um, who were part of this system, um, and I think I wonder about the ways that that is also um, part of the, the structural mechanism um, in um, in France broadly. That what would it look like if you had finding aids that took very seriously, you know, Haiti's relationship to France, um, Senegal's relationship to France. Um, we're only just recently have like it was, it was twenty years I think with the uh, La the, the, uh, um, Tobira, you have just recent acknowledgement of the genocide in in Algeria. Like, there's just recently that 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 France itself structurally is acknowledging some of the um, really terrific violences that is engaged broadly in the world. Um, I think that that work is happening. I hope in continuing, but I think that that um, structurally there has been a resistance really charting that out because then you would have to offer restitution um, in in whatever ways that looks. Um, so I think that that is, um, that is a really key there, and I, I, I salute everybody who's doing really amazing work on, on pushing that. Um, I follow Rokhaya uh, Jallo, and I just think that she's, and other folks who are just amazing. Um, um, so foodways and material culture. So what's great about this question <laughs> is that foodways become, like, and other ways of thinking, like, sort of beyond the text are really, really critical. So one of the things I try and do in the book, and I didn't, I would have loved to do more of it, um, is, is look at maps as resources um, for thinking about sort of how the French are conceiving of their imagined colonial space, like, you know, like kind of the, the grids in New Orleans maps are always fascinating to me because at the same time you have this grid map, you also have all, you know, these accounts that say, oh, this person would not, you know, you know, this person would not build on the grid. So I had their, um, Adrian Paget was famous for this. I had their house razzed to the ground. And so like now he's before the Superior Council, you know, being, you know, um, <laughs> scolded um, by an upset former homeowner. Um, and he's just like defiant. He was just like, no, it just should have been on the grid. So like there's a fantasy that that French officials have about where and how place is going to be made that is also about their fantasy of empire. Um, and, um, and, and you can see that play out in, in the text. You also see really interesting things in, in portraiture and in images. Um, we, this is an, in Louisiana's archive in particular. Is there's almost no images of 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 uh, African women um, in the French period. Um, I did not find any. Um, I think maybe there are some that I did not find and, and could talk about later on. I'm still trying to to excavate them. I think I found a few for the the French period, um, or like few like one or two. Um, you have some a few images of African men. In things like um, map cartouches, there's a, there's a watercolor that I talk about in the book that has African men in it. Um, but for the most part, there's not a kind of 
portraiture archive like you have in the Caribbean, Bruni, uh, like uh, Augustino Bruni, for example, like you know, talking about um, Jean de Bet, like people who are painting watercolors in the Caribbean. So, so it was interesting sort of like non-text, um, non-alphanumeric uh, resources, excuse me, <laughs> resources that are available. But that then means that there's a lot of space for material culture. So I think of the work of like Sophie White, who's doing amazing work on style and on clothing and the exchanging of um, culture as also political and social um, between French and indigenous nations um, in mainly upper Illinois, but also goes down um, into, into the Indiana area. Um, and I think food is a space where that can be talked about very much more. It's usually talked about in the 19th century um, and thinking about food as, as um, both a retention of, of African food ways of various African ethnicities that come over, but also food as this, um, as this battleground between Afro-Creole and white Creoles and over claiming who is the authentic Louisianian cuisine as part of who is authentic Louisiana culture. Um, anyway. I, I think that more could be done with food. So for example, Mama Kumba, um, one of the stories that I have in, in, in one of the chapters, it was, um, who is having her feast, right? Um, which is very much a Senegambian you know, feast. So there's a, a link here also with Taranga, which is um, the Wolof, um, Sen Senegal, um, not necessarily Wolof, the Senegal um, word for hospitality, which hospitality is taken very, very seriously in Senegal society. Um, so there's a link there with that, that I think could be an interesting sort of like um, long history there. Um, but Mama Kumba's feast, um, as far as we can tell so far in the archive, is the first instance of the reference to gumbo, um, which in and of itself is like, if you know anything about Louisiana, is like a key critical cultural dish. Um, and so there's some interesting work there that could be done about like what are the kind of resonances there and the histories of the food, the, the, the ingredients there, because it's actually kind of intricate. You know, Taste record. The ingredients there, um, the discussion of filet, uh, which is out of um, uh, indigenous um, Choctaw, I believe, um, uh, uh, food way. So there's some interesting work that I think can be done, and especially in this place, um, but also as a, as a resource and a source. Um, and that in some ways gets us to thinking about um, the DH. So Life Code Digital Humanities Against Enclosure is a project that I, um, that I direct. Um, I am um, really honored to have an amazing group of folks who are members, um, who are collaborators on it. Um, we uh, describe ourselves as kind of a collection of, of labs that are doing projects that are about um, decolonial, anti-racist praxis and thought. And so how can we turn a DH inside out and or use DH as tools for, um, for creating a, essentially a, a better world, a, a, a world that is, not, that is not the legacy of, of slavery that it, that it is now. Um, and it, the um, some of the the ways of thinking about the digital um, very much come into thinking about the archive. Um, how do we turn a slave ship register um, un upside down and inside out? How do we see um, voyages as not just data of people that are then you know like taken from one place and landed in another, but how do we see that as also a kind of broader understanding of how diasporic lives are lived and created? Um, or truncated um, and destroyed. Like, how do we actually confront that as like of histories of people and not just histories of numbers and and uh, and grid? But also the other side of that, how do we also challenge um, DH and technology and those who are using um, technology or interested in DH to think about this longer history of the tools of you know the spreadsheet as a as as part of um, as a descendant of the slave ship register. Like how do we actually like that's actually it's an actual concrete history um, that we can chart out um, that is uh, that is that work is already be, being done by um, oh, I'm going to blank on her name but I can see the title of the book is accounting for slavery um, and so this I don't think that that's the first first history that or last history that we're going to encounter that really implicates these the, the digital tools and the technology that has given um, that has given rise to the world around us. In, a, um, in the history of, of slavery. Simone Brown's work on um, passport as um, the passports that emerge in um, 1775 after Lord Dunmore's proclamation as actually the first manifestation of the passport, the Brooks um, plan of the slave ship as the first study of surveillance. You know, like if you go back and, and really kind of chart some of these histories, um, they are part of, um, part of the histories of slavery. And even if you just take the tools on their surface, most of them are part of eras of Cold War and defense budgets, 
Um, the computer itself is it gets it gets a real boost itself from um, uh, the Department of Defense, you know, like and are happen is happening in the same moment as African decoloni uh, decolonization and struggles against um, European impositions and, and control of the continent itself. So there's a lot of layers and a lot of overlaps um, that mean that sure we should take these tools and use them, but we also then have to be really critical of, of them, and we also can you know, we don't have to take them as seriously as we sort of tend to. So one of the projects I'm on is um, um, called Bites of Black Flesh, which is a project I was doing on the uh, Louisiana census um, and how to turn them inside out um, and how to think about instead of, you know, transmuting the census into now a, you know, spreadsheet or some other digital database, what would it mean to have a speculative census that surfaces the, um, the Black women or the Black people in 1731 in Louisiana, the populations that aren't counted, like maroon populations, like those who are moving back and forth between the plantations and the city um, or the town at that time. Um, so that's one of the projects. And another project is um, in some ways doing the opposite, is taking up these digital tools and saying, hey, you know, we now have the power to really release some of these documents from where they've been bound as manuscript form in their paleographic script form and as French and Spanish documents when, you know, the majority of Louisiana population these days not necessarily reading French and Spanish, certainly not 18th century French and Spanish. So Keywords for Black Louisiana, um, one of the projects that it's going to be doing this summer is a digital edition with scholarly editing called um, Kinship and Black Life in Louisiana's Archive. And so we'll be transcribing um, and presenting using keywords and stories some of the documentation from this archive, um, from the 18th century archive, um, with an eye towards not necessarily academics as an audience, but genealogists, Black, um, Black Louisiana families, um, everyday researchers, K through 12 teachers, people who can take this material and use it um, in a context where places like Louisiana are also fighting against you know, critical race theory and you know, having conversations on the legislative floor about, you know, oh, well, shouldn't we have the good of slavery? Um, and, and make that part of our curriculum too, which it's unbelievable that we're in this conversation right now, but we are, which means we have to use um, for what we can and really um, and really get into the fight. Wow, thank you so much. You, you were able to answer all parts of those questions. Um, <laughs> um, and thank you so much for such a wonderful book and thank you everyone for, for listening and participating. And I hope you all will be able to enjoy it for yourselves if you haven't already. And um, I wanted to thank Sally and Jeff for inviting me to participate in this um, in this event. Thank you for having me. Thank you for the questions. Thank you for being in conversation with you. Oh, so My pleasure. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody.